Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. In today's podcast, I'm joined by the incredible nutritionist, Vicky Godfrey. Vicky is a nutritional therapist. She's based on Harley Street. Uh, she has a whole array of different types of clients. And we're going to be talking about food, but not just food. We're also going to be talking about DNA and what our DNA can tell us about the food we should be eating and the lifestyle that we should be undertaking. So Vicky, uh, you are a Harley Street uh, nutritional therapist. Uh, tell us a bit about your day, uh, your day, what, you know, how do you help people get better? How do you look after their health? And then I also want to go and talk a bit about DNA. Okay. So hi everyone, I'm Vicky um, and I'm a nutritional therapist who has a clinic in Harley Street. Um, so generally I work with people on a functional medicine basis, um, trying to get to the root of the problem to help bring people's body back into balance. And that's quite, that's quite wide. I work a lot in cancer. I also studied advanced cancer care nutrition for a year after qualifying. Um, and then I got really interested into DNA. So I also do a lot of DNA testing where we work to optimize people's health based on their foundations of their genetics of what they already have. So it's fascinating. I love it. Yeah, no, it sounds absolutely fascinating. Now, I've just had a look at your website before uh, we, we, we start talking together. Um, I take it you take like a swab of the mouth and from, yeah. so there's not even blood samples, but just from taking a swab in the mouth, analyzing, I guess, the saliva, you can, you can deduct a lot of information from that. Is that correct? That's correct. So we test for 700,000 genes or SNPs, as they're called, SMPs. Um, and we only report at the moment on about 70 of them because that's all the evidence that we have at the moment on those genes. But as more and more evidence comes out, we'll be adding more and more to those reports because we're completely evidence-based and scientific. Um, but it's great for things like lactose intolerance, gluten intolerance. Um, we look at the immune system genes, which has been really apt for the time right now to know whether your immune system is more susceptible to bacteria or viruses. Uh, we look at alcohol sensitivity, salt sensitivity. I mean, so much from diet, sleep, hormones, fitness. You know, it's a real, real, um, real good way to really get to know yourself, really. Now... <laughs> You mentioned so many things there that I want to pick up on. Sorry. Uh, that's fantastic. It's fantastic. So um, DNA. So let's go back to 101 for those that are joining us that maybe don't know a lot about DNA. And I must admit, it's not an area I know lots about. Uh, what I did write, write in my, my very first book, um, I think it was in my second and third one, but I said DNA is a bit like, well, let me give you an example. So uh, my mother's got Alzheimer's. I lost three grandparents to cancer, sadly. And uh, therefore... My understanding is if you've got things that run in the family, there is a chance that your chances of getting it have increased somewhat. But don't overly panic about that because it's a bit like a gun. That The trigger may be slightly more loaded for me for Alzheimer's because my mum's got it, but lifestyle and diet and so on are still needed to pull the trigger and push me down sadly the same route. Is that First of all, we're on the same page with, with that sort of analogy. Yes, totally, totally. So it comes down to your foundations are your foundations, but they might not necessarily express. So for example, the lactose intolerance gene, um, well, it's not very rare that we don't see that expressing. Actually, we see expressing uh, the majority of the time, but there are some other genes that don't express. And you might go over it with a client and you say that you've got this gene, that gene, and they say, oh, I have none of those symptoms. So this is where it comes down to epigenetics. And epigenetics is where your environmental factors, like you just listed, diet, lifestyle, um, can actually change whether those actually turn those genes on or off. 
I think is the most easiest way to explain it. So if you do have some of the cancer genes, which um, we do collect, we don't report for at the moment because we believe that should be done in a, in a medical environment with proper medical support from doctors, you know, the cancer gene and not, not just get, getting a PDF report. Um, but just as that as an example, if you're suddenly eating loads of bad food, doing a lot of bad stuff to yourself, then you're more likely to see that gene express within itself. So lifestyle factors are a huge, huge part in epigenetics and turning those genes on and off. And epigenetics, for those that have not heard that word before, that means on top of your genes, doesn't it? So it's, it's, the envir it's your environment on top of the genes that you've kind of inherited. Totally. Yeah, it's just literally epigenetics is your, is your environment that turns the genes on or off. That's a really, in a nutshell, in layman's terms. No, that's 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 great. <laughs> I love things in <laughs> layman's terms because sometimes we get so caught up in our own little world that we forget even explaining uh, you know, the, the basics. So thank you very much for that. So go back to just for example, so I understand even more. Uh, so lacto lactose intolerant. Don't people know that they're lactose intolerant without having to know have a uh, like a, a DNA test, or is it the fact that some people are actually intolerant to it? or sensitive to it maybe, but don't realize, and it might manifest itself in say IBS or something like that, and they just don't realize that milk is actually causing them a problem. Is that the case? Yes, um, generally, I mean, you're right. That some, people, um, some people might suspect they have a dairy intolerance, but because they like cheese so much, they refuse to give it up, uh, despite the symptoms, despite constipation or diarrhea. I've got quite a few clients that get diarrhea if, if they eat. Sometimes people need that scientific validation that they've got that gene and then they might actually give up the dairy. Um, and I'm sorry, there was quite a lot in that question. Um, sorry, my brain. No, no, no. That, that was, I mean, you answered it. Yeah, it, it's helping some people that may have slight symptoms because, you know, literally, a high percentage of people around the world, especially in Asian countries, are lactose intolerant. They just don't realise that they are. So they might have a lifelong of suffering with stomach problems and cramps and, like, say, diarrhoea, not knowing that it's the milk that's causing it. And then by doing the DNA test, it highlights that they've got the gene that makes them, uh, I take it, lactose intolerant. You mentioned then uh, about alcohol and alcohol tolerance. What can you tell from, from genes? I'm very interested in this one because one of the things I do participate in too much is the old red wine. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what can we learn from the genes about that? So um, how the body converts the um, certain chemicals of the alcohol and how the liver detoxes the, the, the alcohol. So I process alcohol normally, which is, which is good. If you're a slow, um, if, if it takes longer for you to process the alcohol, it means that um, part of the formaldehyde family will sit there staying in the body, which can then create more toxicity within the body. You want to get the alcohol because alcohol, as we know, is a known toxin. We want to get it out of the body as quick as possible. Um, so therefore, how quick or slow you process the alcohol is a really good indicator to how sick or not sick alcohol can make your body, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's from the DNA. That, that, I find that absolutely fascinating. Uh, what's, and what's how, so, how, how, how do you find that out from the DNA? I'm, I'm still missing a bit of the jigsaw here. It's, it's incredible. So um, if I give you an example, the, the, the SNPs have certain names and then we know uh, we have two chromosomes um, and sometimes um, one is only expressing uh, and then the other one isn't expressing and that gives us an indication of where you are with those genes. Um, it all gets quite a bit complicated to go any more into it than that, but it comes down to your chromosomes and your left and your right uh, and which, which one the gene sits within. Uh, if you've got them within both genes, that means that you'll have a higher impact into your life with that. Uh, if, if only one, one of the chromosomes is expressing, then the impact is uh, more medium. And then if you have none within that gene, then, the, then you just don't have that gene to express, if that makes sense. Well, I tell you what, you've got me so fascinated on this that I'm going to 
get one of your kits, send it yes. off to you and see what you tell me about myself. Uh, I, I, and then I always say, and Dr. Mark and Kendrick, who I work with quite a lot, says, we have to be quite careful sometimes we don't overanalyze everything because we can send ourselves into a complete mental breakdown. But it, we have to then tra- treat those results, don't we? We look at them and go, okay, well, that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean I'm definitely going to do this or have this or have this problem or that problem. But now I know that I'm leaning that way over that side of the fence a bit more Then maybe I should cut down on this or try this or, and so on. Um, it's not yes. A- it's not it's not the be all and end all. Um, for example, one of the things we look at is the vitamin D receptors. So you might be vitamin D deficient, but you might live in a hot, hot sunny country. And you're like, well, how, how is that possible? And that might be because your vitamin D receptors aren't absorbing the vitamin D. So therefore... Some of the um, suggestions that we would give would be to supplement or there are certain foods that help the uh, processes happen in the liver. But you're right, there are, there are um, the controversial genes we don't report on and that's because we, we do look at your Alzheimer's genes, we do look at your cancer genes. But again, uh, reporting on those within uh, the scenario of how we do with the PDF reports and then an app is coming later in the year to support those results. We find that, um, again, if you know, like you said earlier, if you've got that cancer gene or that Alzheimer's gene, it's not 100% that you're actually going to develop any of those conditions. Yeah. It just means that you need to be more careful and, yeah. and um, you know, live on, live on the better side of life, you know, rather than just living on processed junk foods, which we all know are really bad for us anyway. And a lot of the rules in, in nutrition of a healthy, balanced diet, which means lots of fruit and veg, um, applies, you know, across all of the genes, really, in one respect. Now, it's interesting because you just mentioned, for example, vitamin D, which is a hot topic at the moment. Which we'll, in fact, we'll talk about yeah. that in a moment. Um, you know, my wife is vitamin D deficient. It's come up in the last two or three blood tests. Uh, I'm not. And yet we've gone the same holidays. We've got the same sort of uh, skin tones. And, uh, you know, she keeps going, um, how come I'm deficient and you're not? I also have the same thing I say to her. How come if I look at a pizza or a piece of bread I put on a stone and she can eat anything she wants and get away with it and still be slender? Uh, and so I'm, I, think, I think I've got two questions there. So is DNA responsible for whether or partly responsible for whether we uh, don't absorb enough vitamin D? Uh, and also, is DNA got something to do with the fact of why is it my wife can eat anything and not put on weight and if I eat anything that's wrong it goes straight to the waistline yes totally you just nailed it on the head it comes down to your DNA so if you can't if there are two of you in the same household one is um you know vitamin d levels are amazing and like you said you go on the same holidays and the other person isn't it does come down to the vitamin d receptors of how it converts um vitamin d in the body and how you absorb the vitamin D. Also, um, like you said, with um, if you just look at a pizza, you put on weight, totally again, um, when you do a DNA test, we guide you. So for example, a high carb diet does not suit me. I'm much more suited to higher omega-3s, a fish diet, and um, a lot more vegetables, fruit. Um, I also have a liver deletion gene which means that my body can't detoxify so well. Um, So again, I need to keep my diet very, very clean and eat eight to 10 um, cruciferous veg, which for those of you that might not know what cruciferous veg is, it's your broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, um, rocket, you know, quite green leafy, green leafy veg um, to help my detox pathways to detox. And since working with my DNA, I was quite a big girl after my second pregnancy. I was at 13 and a half stone. Working with my DNA, another three and a half stone dropped off in one year. And then the following year, I wasn't so pedantic about following uh, the DNA advice, but still another um, uh, one and a half stone dropped off. So I'm now down to eight and a half stone, 44 years old. I have none of that middle age spread that people talk about that you get when you hit your 40s and 50s. Um, so I truly believe that I having a DNA test done myself really helped me to bring my body back into balance for my genes and my individuality because we're all completely different. Yeah, absolutely 
Fascinating. And <laughs> it, it, with the vitamin, back to vitamin D for a second then. So uh, it's about the receptor sites in the body, but you can learn about those receptor sites. Just make sure I'm getting this correct, because I, 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 once I learn something, I go and tell everybody, but I want to make sure I've got it right. So you can tell about your receptor sites, receptor sites within the body and your ability to, to, for, to you know, latch onto the vitamin D. You can learn that from the swab of DNA. Yes. Wow. It's yes. fascinating, isn't it? It's it really is. It, it's, um, it's absolutely um, blow my mind, the whole, the whole thing with the DNA. And that, this is where DNA Power was born. I, because of part of our training, we had to do DNA tests. But the DNA test gave you some information, but they didn't then tell you what to do. Yes. So I was sitting in Tesco's one day, just looking at all this fruit and veg, just thinking, I just want someone to tell me how to eat mm -hmm. for um, my DNA. I just want someone to tell me, give me a shopping list that, that will optimize my health for my DNA. So I phoned my friend who was really deep into DNA at the time, and we'd studied together, um, but I'd gone off into cancer. She'd gone off into DNA. And I phoned her and I said, what about DNA POW? Let's create something that's the POW to everybody's DNA so we can really help them optimize their health. Some people on Instagram call it hashtag biohacking. Some people are absolutely terrified of the word biohacking because it's got hacking in it. But it's not like we're hacking your systems. We are truly just optimizing what you've been given and the individuality of every single person because no two people's DNA are the same. Um, but the other thing with DNA Power is what we've done is we've, we've done an ethical choice. Some of the DNA companies do use the DNA samples for research. We destroy all DNA samples um, after the swab test has been done, so you've got no fear of your DNA ending up anywhere that you might not want it to end up. So yeah, um, Google, Google, know report, enough, Google know enough about us already. <laughs> Exactly. And your DNA is really valuable. So it gets destroyed. You get your report. You've still got your raw data of your 700,000 SNPs. Um, and like I said, and as the data comes out, we can just keep adding, adding, adding. And therefore, we hope to be your power for life, guiding you based on your genetics and, and your, your foundations of what you've been given um, from birth. It's brilliant. You know what? You uh, Sometimes the people that are most sceptical end up being your best customers. And honestly, when I first heard about this uh, through uh, kind of my team at Primal Living, I went, two things. One, I, I can't believe that it's accurate. And two, too much information is probably not a good thing. But you've got a convert here. I, I get it. I, I get it. All, we, all we're doing is we're not looking at the cancer markers, although we could. We're not looking at the Alzheimer's ones. We're just looking at the things that you can really, really make a difference on. Uh, uh, almost like the way yeah. you phrased it there, it's helping you get your shopping list together of what you should be eating and maybe what you should be avoiding based on, on, on your own specific DNA. Totally. And I love the fact that I, I, when I look back in London, I worked in TV for 20 years before retraining. I worked at the BBC. I have worked at uh, I've had my own production company and it's very long hours and I lived on a lot of takeaways. I always had a swollen tummy at the end of the night. I just thought it was because I'd eaten too much. I look back now and I, I do have the gluten sensitivity gene. I look back now, my breakfast in the morning in the production company was bacon sandwich. At lunch I would have pasta and then in the evening because we'd be going late on a deadline, I would eat a takeaway that generally had some sort of pizza, pasta, noodles. Um, and looking back, I can see why I was bloated, why I was probably constipated, but wasn't that conscious or aware of what was going on in my body. Whereas now um, I have a different level of awareness and I, I like to make sure that I put all the nutrients in and I'm guided and the results are what you see in yourself if you know what I mean, you know, being yeah. being the smallest I've been since I was 18 years old, uh, feeling the best, getting compliments at 44, the, um, you know, so you just know, don't you? And all yeah. of that has come from doing my DNA test and being able to tweak and change things. But th th there haven't even been huge changes. So a bit more fish in my diet, not much bread or pasta has completely gone from my diet and, and a higher level of fruit and vegetables because of my liver deletion gene which you know will make my body more toxic if i don't look after it the right way so now i do because i have that knowledge 
That's absolutely fascinating. Now, when we do these podcasts, we never know which way we're going to... We have a topic to start <laughs> off with, uh, and we never know which way it's going to turn and which course we're going to go on. Uh, I want to pick up it during the hour, if we can, on cancer, uh, as that's one of my uh, sort of obviously big concerns in life. Uh, I'd also... Let's, let's pick up on vitamin C and vitamin D. Um, don't know when people are going to be watching this programme. We're currently filming it sort of towards the end of certainly the first wave of... Of, of, of COVID. Uh, what's your view? And if, if, you, if you haven't got one, just say I haven't got one. Uh, but have you got a view on vitamin C, vitamin D, COVID, and whether it's uh, a benefit to have be topped up? Or... When, you... <laughs> yes. um, when you study advanced cancer care, you cannot not love vitamin C. Um, vitamin C plays a huge, huge role mm. in your health, plays a huge role in adrenal health and stress plays a huge role in mopping up free radicals in the body that perhaps the environment has created. Also, as well, vitamin D gets carried around the red blood cells into the white blood cells to help fight infection. So if I was ever to get stuck on a desert island and I can only ever take one vitamin with me, it would probably be vitamin C hands down. Because for me, the benefits are just huge. Even just for anyone that's into anti-aging, your body can't produce collagen without vitamin C. So the processes are, you know, the, the, the benefits of vitamin C are tenfold, works on so many levels. Um, and we can't produce vitamin C, our bodies can't make it. So you do have to keep making sure you're either eating vitamin C rich foods or taking lots of vitamin C supplements. So I am one of the biggest, biggest fans of vitamin C. So what, what, um, what do you, and what do you... vitamin C. What, oh, do you, what, what, do you, what do you take personally, a couple of grams a day or? Um, I probably range between two to 3,000 per day. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I'm sick, as soon as that sore throat comes or that sniffle comes, I take 1,000 and then I'll take it hourly yeah. until that sniffle goes. And then I, I touch wood, I don't get sick. It doesn't develop into a bad cold or doesn't develop into a bad flu. Um. So, yeah, um, and the times that I have let stuff develop, so I've been in places where I haven't had access to any vitamin C or any decent vitamin C, and it's developed. And when that sickness gets hold of you, it's actually much harder to reverse. It's much easier to take a vitamin C as soon as that sore throat comes on or that sniffle, and you can feel it. Bomb it then, kill it then, rather than waiting till it fully develops, and then again, you can um, easily go up to 5,000 without bowel tolerance. In cancer, we see people can easily tolerate up to about 80 grams per day. Wow. And that gives you an indication of how sick the body is. And that's why I, I support um, IV vitamin C, which is about 200 grams. Um, and that bypasses the digestive system, causing any kind of loose bowel symptoms, but can really get to helping the body. And and there are over 80,000 studies um, on vitamin C, um, which will support, you know, all these various pathways of vitamin C and how wonderful it is as a vitamin. So and, what, go on. Why, why do you think there's been so much resistance? Uh, I, I, I'm sure you know Patrick Holford. Uh, Patrick and I were, were trying to raise the profile of vitamin C during the early days of, of COVID because there was research coming out of China, there was research coming out of Italy, there was hospitals in uh, in New York that were giving patients and the, the, the hospital staff, the nurses, the doctors and everybody, you know, lots and lots of vitamin C. Um, and yet there was just a complete brick wall uh, in the UK when we were trying to talk to the NHS about this. I know. I, um, I do know Patrick. I've uh, met him a few times on various um, events and things. Um, and I have a, a neighbour who is also in Bart's Hospital, and I have another neighbour uh, in London who is at Guy's Hospital, and I've spoken to both of them trying to infiltrate their minds with vitamin D and vitamin C, just trying to do my bit, always sharing on my Facebook wall um, the, the, the um, studies that they did, or, or the, there was a few things... Uh, that were, were shareable on Facebook about New York using vitamin C and China, and I shared all of those. But I really, I felt quite stonewalled when I talked to my neighbours. It was almost like, you know, we're doctors, you're just a nutritionist, Vicky, what do you know? 
But from my understanding, the medical schools teach nothing about nutrition. Um, and they don't teach them the, the power of these vitamins. So I just think it's just down to lack of understanding. And I don't want to use the word ignorance. I would want to be politer than that and just say that it's just down to lack of um, lack of the training in the medical schools and, and not having the time to do their own research, but therefore they don't have that in their belief systems, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And back to vitamin C and cancer, talk about you know, uh, IV uh, uh, when people have got cancer. What, what, what is it being used for uh, intravenously, for what type of cancers? And is it to stop the spread or what, what, how is it sort of being used in cancer treatment? Um, some studies have said after chemo, if you take it after chemo, it helps mop up all the free radicals of the damage of um, chemo. So it's quite good. So the chemo will have done its job by the time you've left the hospital if you're on an IV drip. Um, so the vitamin C goes around and mops up all the damage, the extra damage, because if we do look at chemotherapy, it's highly toxic. When it kills the tumour, it kills everything as well so your body has to be strong enough to also recover from the everything if that makes sense um, so vitamin c can help lessen some of the damage that can get done from the chemo when we're just at high dosage and we're looking at people that might want to go completely natural in their choices which it does happen um, the 200 grams of vitamin c can actually be shown to help shrink the tumors um, and like I said, with the 200 grams as well, it just completely bypasses uh, the digestive system. So you don't have so much of the loose stool effects. And there's also a story about a guy with meningitis. We were taught on our advanced cancer nutrition course. I haven't verified this as well. So, so please bear with me. This is like a, this is a story that was shared by a lecturer on our course. She said there was a boy who had meningitis and they didn't know what to do with him and he had lung punctures and they had all sorts and they'd given the parents about 48 hours um, to live and the parents begged for um, intravenous vitamin C. He left the hospital 48 hours later. So if that story is true, uh, which our lecturer said it was, um that could really you know there are a whole host of viruses and um diseases that vitamin c is really really powerful for and like like i said with over eighty thousand studies to go through for vitamin c but the doctors don't seem to look at the studies so i often have chats with doctors that i go and see as well you know if, if i need something I, I don't go to it since i've retrained I, I rarely go to a doctor but the odd one that i have seen um, some of them have been really, really um, open to some of the suggestions like magnesium with my, there's a study out there in, in PubMed saying that if you take magnesium, it can clear up about 90% of headaches. And one doctor wrote down everything and he was like, God, thank you, Vicky. I'm really going to study that. I had no idea that magnesium could help with headaches. Um, but like I said, the other two doctors that I've been speaking to at Guy's and uh, at Bart's in London, I've just been stonewalled when I've tried to talk to them about vitamin D and vitamin C methods with, with the virus that's going around at the moment. But I have treated seven households with corona and nobody's died. Interestingly, only one person in each household has got it. None of the other household members have got it. And each household has had varying ages in there. Um, 65 years old is the oldest that I've treated. Um, I've had one household where two people had the same um, symptoms, but and one was 65, one was 55, there's a 10 year gap in their relationship. They just got back from skiing in Italy just as it was all breaking out. They moved with the symptoms, I put them on a vitamin C, olive leaf, vitamin D um, protocol, there was a couple of other things. Uh, the girl that does regular cl cleanses with me, she was through it within about a week to 10 days. Um, when they both tested for COVID, her husband, who is 10 years older than her, 65, um, he suffered a lot longer uh, for three weeks. He also, um, you know, drinks probably quite a bit more alcohol. She regularly does three liver, clean liver um, not liver, sorry, liver cleanses with me a year. 
So her body is, because um, I run regular detox programs as well, so she, she does three a year with me. And what I did note was that the virus passed through her body very, very quick. By the time they got their results back from the um, corona or COVID test, she tested negative, he tested positive. Hmm. So I was like, well, does that mean that because your body's a lot cleaner, that it's gone through your system quicker? Or did you not have it and just your husband had it and you might have had something else? Um, but really, really interesting, in the other six households, only one person has had it. Nobody else has even got sick in, in the um, households. Um, and not all of the household did I treat. So some I gave extra vitamin C for the people in the household, so they didn't get it and they didn't. Um, and other households haven't wanted to and just didn't get it, which, you know, considering they say it's so contagious, but it lives on surfaces and it lives on cash and we all have to wear masks and two meter distancing. That wasn't what I was seeing in, in, in the households that I worked with. Very, 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 very interesting uh, indeed. Mm. Um, talk, talk, touched on again, a lot of things there. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and that helped, no, no, it's great. It helps, it helps because I love to just go in different directions. Uh, uh, magnesium, I'm a big fan of magnesium. I take it every day and touch a bit of wood. Uh, I can't remember the last headache I, I had. I don't take it for that. I take it for other reasons. But um, yeah, magnesium, a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal uh, vitamin. Um, so you've been treating some of your uh, 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 customers with vitamin C, vitamin D, getting some great results. Uh, let's go back to food then. Uh, as you train as a nutritional therapist, I know we're all different. We've all got different DNA. Uh, but what advice have you got around food if you're going to say, you know, on mass for, for most people? Um, if you want to keep your immune system healthy, so um, one, of the, one of the things that Poppy, um, your lovely, lovely presenter Poppy, got in touch last week, um, and one of the things that we were trying to, or one of the posts that I put out was about trying to start a campaign about beat the second wave that the media keep talking about and educating people on immune systems and how to how to eat better so one of the things that um, we really want to do is educate people on how how sugar is not so great for the system and processed foods aren't so great for the system so in my eyes a, a, a diet full of fruit vegetables bioflavonoids and um, lots of great vitamins and all of that will far um, serve your body a lot better and your immune system a lot better than when every time we eat sugar, the sugar um, reduces your immune system's ability for about five hours. Right. So if you're in a crowded place eating lots of sugary foods, then your immune system's just not going to be working great. So you're going to be more susceptible to any of these viruses flying around, not even necessarily corona, but, but whatever viruses are, are in the environment. We are always going to have viruses in our environment. We have since however long, and we, and we will keep carrying and the one thing that we've all been given is an immune system. And it's the immune system that we have to look after. So just from diet perspective, lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, lay off the sugar so you don't turn your immune system off. Lay off the booze. So, you know, maybe follow the 80-20 rule where 80% of the time you're good and you eat really clean. Um, and then there's a 20% time where you can have things uh, that aren't so clean or so good or perhaps maybe higher in sugar. Um, don't eat the ready meals, you know, that are served in the supermarkets. Keep your diet clean. Cook everything from scratch. I know you. some of you might be thinking, oh, my God, but I get home from work and I'm so tired and I don't have time to put all the ingredients together and peel and, and things like that. We live in a busy household and we have two small children and we, you know, we can't not focus on their nutrition. You can't unlearn what you've learned so we batch cook we batch cook lots of healthy meals that we freeze so we've always got something quick to go and we might do that at a weekend so they're like some of my top tips of how you can make sure that um you know whatever you cook and prep even like a spaghetti bolognese meat we hide carrots broccoli um, mushrooms all chopped quite finely for our children to eat so they don't spot it but, you know, that makes perfect for freezing. And, and then you've got a, a nutritious 
meal with extra vegetables in it ready to go when you get home. So um, lots of different ways to keep, keep your um, diets on track. But definitely alcohol, sugar and processed foods are the three things that you want to keep your immune system healthy. Really keep your eye on um, how much of those you consume because they're really not good for the body. Absolutely. Just great, great advice. Now, one thing we, we are, we're, we've done so many episodes, I think we're in our 30th or 40th episode already. Uh, um, and yet we've never talked about detox at all with anybody without telling us all your trade secrets, because we don't want to stop people coming for their, their course. <laughs> uh, you talked about uh, one of your clients uh, earlier on that you put her on three detoxes a year. Um, what? Just give us an overview, because there are some people that go, Detox is a complete waste of time. I'm not one of them. I think detoxing is really important. Um, but give us your, 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 your sort of strategy on detoxing. Okay, so because I have the liver deletion gene, my body does not detox as well as the, somebody with, without that, you know, um, with the, the liver gene, mine's deleted. So I don't detox, neither does my partner. He also has the same liver deletion gene and we've both passed it on to one of our children. And that's where some of my interest into detox and my passion has come. So the people that don't believe in detox, I understand because the body is always detoxing. Every single day, our body is detoxing. Right now in our environment, we have 85,000 known toxins in our environment. To give you some perspective on that, in early 1900s, there was only 2,000 known toxins in our environment. So the toxins or the toxicity of the world is growing tenfold, you know, huge, huge. Um, so when you go on a detox, I run mine for 10 days, um, and it's just about focusing on 10 days of putting the right stuff in. And we, um, we take five things out of the diet for those 10 days. We take out wheat, dairy, sugar, alcohol, and caffeine. All five of those food groups generally as a, as a um, just as a general thing, are all inflammatory to the body and can cause inflammatory responses. Um, so we take those out, so it reduces inflammation in the body. Um, a lot of people realize when they do this 10 day focused, no wheat, dairy, sugar, um, how much, how little fruits and vegetables they actually normally have in their normal lives. So what we tend to find at the end of the 10 days is I get a message and they say, God, Vicky, you've really woke me up. I'd forgotten to eat fruit. I tend to go for a chocolate bar instead of an apple. But your program made me go for the apple rather than the, the chocolate bar. And wow, I, my energy levels are amazing. And you tend to find that, say, from the caffeine perspective, some people might be drinking four or five cups of coffee a day. It's a crutch. It's a crutch that something else isn't working so well in the body if, if they keep reaching out for that caffeine because they feel so tired. And generally by day four, their energy levels can be a little bit low. But by day five and six, the text messages or, or messages I get in the Facebook group is, wow, I feel amazing, Vicky. My energy levels are off the roof. I don't ever want to go back to caffeine um, and stuff like that. So I'm quite passionate about just having 10 days to focus on your detox pathways and putting the right nutrients in. If you look at phase two detoxification, from a biochemistry sense, there are certain nutrients that need to go in at certain stages to help phase two detoxification happen. So it's not a fad. The, the, mine's all about by um, science and the correct nutrients. You're just literally taking out the poisonous aspects of our diets that have now crept into Western society, which is you know, um, alcohol and the sugar are, are two of the biggest things that, that people have. So I hope that helps and explain it. No, it's great. And, you know, saying that we've gone from, say, 100 years ago, about 2,000 known toxins uh, to, what did you say, something like 80,000 known toxins. Um, are you also, uh, uh, as I am, a big believer in that it's not just toxins that we eat, it's also we're so used to these days, sadly, in, in the westernised world, constantly putting creams, lotions, potions, hair gels, uh, shampoos, uh, creams, uh, makeup that are just loaded with chemicals. We have no idea really what the effect on the body is. 
T totally. So the 84,000 known toxins that we have now means that our systems are overloaded. The liver can't process it fast enough. It's just too many toxins. Um, so one of the things that we were taught at college was don't ever put on your hair or your body anything that you wouldn't want to eat. Your skin is your biggest organ that we have and everything that you put on your skin does get absorbed by the bloodstream. Then it circulates around the body and the liver still has to deal with it. So if you do want to do a face mask, think of olive oil, think of avocados, all great, great, really, you know, um, nutrients to put into the skin and high in vitamin E. Um, so, yeah, all of that adds another toxic level, even from your toothpaste. You know, you can Google some of the um, things on the back and you will be quite surprised to see in some of the mainstream toothpaste that some of those ingredients are listed as carcinogenic. Um, and even my uh, hygienist talks about how the rise of mouth cancer is on the rise. And I asked an innocent question and said, is that down to smoking or is that down? She said, no, she said, it's down to the mouthwash is on the market. Wow. So there you, you know. So, so for you, a, a detox is not just getting your clients to be careful on what they're eating. It's right down to what mouth wash you're using. It, my, my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. James Gornick, who's uh, twice been awarded the number one dentist in the UK, says forget mouthwash. I mean, just forget it. There's no place in it as far as he's concerned for, for dental hygiene. Um, but, um, you know, so forget that all the time, to be quite honest. But on a proper 10-day detox, we're saying... It's food. It's what potions and lotions and creams and things you put in your hair. Don't put on your body, your skin, anything you wouldn't be happy to eat. Probably try and stay away from your mobile as much as you can in your microwave because they put out electric magnet forces. So just try and give your liver 10 days holiday, just like when we go and you know sit on the beach for a week or two to give ourselves a break. Yes, totally. And um, I get clients to turn their Wi-Fi off at night, their routers off at night. So their bodies, when they're healing or resting or cleaning, you know, because you think when you're asleep for eight, nine, ten hours, depending on what your sleep cycles are, uh, that's when deep, deep healing and cleaning is happening. And obviously what you want to do when you wake up, the first thing you want to do is evacuate all the toxins that have been collected overnight by your intestines to your bowel. Yeah. I have many clients, which always worries me, that they need to have a cup of tea or a coffee or a cigarette before they can actually get a bowel movement, which then says to me that the digestive system isn't cleaning out the toxins so well. The other thing I also get clients to do is stop using aluminium in their deodorants. We have a lymphatic system here, and it's for we're supposed to sweat, okay? We're supposed to get our toxins out from that um, area, as well as our poo and our wee. Um, and many breast cancer patients that I work with, I say, when was the last time you used aluminium in your deodorant? And probably 99% of them have all said, on the day of my diagnosis oh, um, yeah. of breast cancer, I stopped using the aluminium deodorant. Um, because people don't want to um, perspire. I've had people in the city that are traders, you know, men, and they go, Vicky, I can't have those big under patches under my arms what can i do and it is a tough one but i tell them to take two or three shirts to work um <laughs> if they can i know it's not ideal but if they're blocking up that lymphatic system to get rid of those toxins out of the body they're going to have more health problems further down the line than worrying about changing from a blue shirt to a pink shirt or if some of these posh places you know in canary wharf have showers or you can slip to the gym for a shower if you need to freshen up you know just trying to put some of those protocols in. I know it might not sound um, the least time consuming protocols, but they're going to keep you healthier for longer. Yeah, let me tell you a true story because this, this is horrific. So my <laughs> lovely auntie, she died at 55 of cancer. And this was way, way before I got uh, into health at all. I was obese at the time and, you know, I was running a business. I had no time to look after myself. And But she said, virtually on a dying bed, deathbed, she says, stop using deodorant because I think it's one of the things that gave me cancer. So this was way before I got into health. So I did. I did exactly what my auntie said. For years and years and years, I didn't use deodorant. Wife always complaining at me that I've got smelly armpits. So at one point, one Christmas, about two, three years ago, she bought me a roll-on that says 100% 
natural. So I started using it. Uh, and then I was working with one of the factories that make our shampoos for us. And uh, I said, you need to uh, do one of these anti uh, perspirant you know, deodorant things. I said, because you know, we need one in our collection. He said, oh, they're really difficult to produce. I said, no, no, I've got one here. And he turned it around and he said, but it's got aluminium in it. And I went, no, it's 100% natural. <laughs> he said, well, aluminium is natural, Steve. And, yes. and they play on words. It's just so frightening sometimes, even when you think you're doing the healthy thing. Some companies just play on words saying it's 100% natural. It's like, how about this one? I found out the other day doing some research when they say 100% natural flavoring. So you've got the word yes. strawberry, 100% natural flavorings. I found out the other day, some companies to get the strawberry flavor, right? Get ready for this. Take it from the gland of the backside of a beaver. There's an extract in the gland of the backside, the bum of a beaver that tastes like strawberry. And then on the packaging, it says natural strawberry flavor. Not naturally from strawberry, wow. from a beaver's bum. Yeah. And it's that I hate it when they play on words. Wow. Oh, I've gone off. All no, they there. do. They do. They're, um, no, they're very, our, our labeling, uh, as much as our labeling is better uh, than some places like America, um, it's still very um, misleading. And I don't trust anything that says 100% natural anymore um, because I look at the shampoos. I won't name some of the brand names, but they go, oh, full of argan oil and this organic and, and, and stuff. And, and then you go through the ingredients and all you can see is a list of long words that you can't pronounce that sound terribly chemical, chemical you know, chemically made, synthetic. Um, and I'm just like, and then you go down and you see it's 2% argan, and then again, it's not even real argan oil, it's a synthetic version of the argan oil, which matches the molecule structure. Yeah. So I only buy now from health food shops. I won't buy from any supermarkets my kids' products. I never touch Johnson & Johnson or anything like that. I only buy, I literally just buy everything from trusted health food shop sources um, or, or, you know, recommendations, or even um, I've, I've looked through your products that you do, and you have some great products on yeah. your um, on your channel and in your shop. So, you know, from those places that we can trust, but yeah. you'd never get me buying any of that stuff in the supermarket or Superdrug or Boots yeah, anymore. I, I, I had a doctor on the other day, he said, oh, what you're preaching is a little bit wrong there, Steve, he said, because, you know, there's no proof yet that what goes through the skin goes into the goes onto the skin goes into the bloodstream. I said, get out of town. He said, no, 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 there's no proof. We don't know. I said, okay, first things, do you agree that if we eat something slightly poisonous, part of the liver's job is to protect our lives? He went, yeah, I agree with that. I said, of course, if it's like there are berries that can kill us, there are mushrooms that can, but slightly poisonous things, the liver's there to do a job. Agreed. Yeah. Then I said to the doctor, if it goes, if something could go through the skin into the blood, do you agree that it then doesn't go through the liver, therefore it could be dangerous? He said, if it could go through the skin. I went, okay. Well, then you tell me now why we have patches for nicotine for people that go on the skin to stop them smoking. He went, I'd never thought about it like that before. But there are still people that say, you know, putting toxic stuff on the skin is not a problem. They, some people still firmly believe that. No, I mean, how, how can it not absorb? Your skin is your biggest organ. So... It is actually classed as an organ, same as your liver, same as your spleen, same as your kidneys. Um, it just seems to be our biggest one. And I think that's probably why some people forget it's an organ or don't know it's an organ. And um, so then seem to think that the skin is some sort of barrier to, to protect all in. But if we look at Epsom salt baths, um, Epsom salt baths, we transdermally absorb the magnesium that way. And sometimes if I've got a client that can't tolerate magnesium because they've got a weakness in their digestive system, Epsom salt bath is the only way that I can get them to absorb the magnesium. And what about when uh, we're using bleach products? We know that the bleach absorbs straight through into our bloodstream and going to our liver where our liver is trying to detox all the you know, side effects from our body's not liking bleach, you know, um, it's not. You know what I'm, I'm trying to say, but um, yeah, no, I'm a big believer that you should only put on your hair. And we also, in cancer, we covered our nails. I didn't know this. So when I did the cancer study, we covered nail varnish. And nail varnish is, I thought nail varnish didn't really matter. I thought your nails protected. But they're huge absorption points. So all them nail varnishes, when they're not 
when they're pretty toxic, is also putting a lot of toxins in. And when you look spiritually, I have a, I run yoga retreats in Ibiza, and we have a Swami that comes out from Rishikesh to teach um, once a week in June normally, but we've been affected this year by him not being able to travel. And obviously no one can come to the retreat because they can't get here. Um, but he says these are huge energy points in your nails and um, fingers. And that from, from a spiritual kind of our energy systems that, that are more subtle that are in our body, which have been proved scientifically, we start to block all those energy systems as well by putting the nail varnish on. So I've stopped for wearing all forms of nail varnish. And in cancer studies, she said that the safest form were those stickers. If you really want your nails to look nice, you can get these nice stickers that you can put on that are much, much safer and have quite a healthy type of um, glue, almost, for the stickers. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, that's, the first, that's what I love about researching around health, that you never stop learning. I, I would never have said to my kids, I've got, I've got three daughters. So I'd never say, I'll oh, stop wearing nail varnish because, uh, you know, because there may be a problem with that. But of course, it, it's an extension of the skin, I guess. And maybe it's not as absorbent as the rest of our skin, but it probably is still. But that's what you're saying is that you're saying the nails are absorbent. I'm saying, yeah, the nails, I was surprised to learn that, but the nails are absorbent. But what was interesting, when you start to mix some of the kind of yogic, um, spirituality of our energy systems as well our fingers and our nails are really important energy points um, so I found that really interesting that um, we are now in a society where it's normal to almost block our energy points that we we would have or should have known about um, you know because say yoga however many thousands of years old it is some of this stuff within yogic science is now being proved in our modern way of looking at science if that makes sense yeah um and we do know that we can see auras and there are cameras that can see auras and we do know uh, that we have subtle energy systems that work through our body and we do know that um we have such a thing as a soul or, or a spirit which is us inside our physical form um, and all of this has been proved more and more, and lots more work's being done in quantum healing. Um, and so I find it quite interesting that through um, society, we are now blocking one of these quite important energy centers with pretty colors that are toxic. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And again, mm. I, I, back to the sort of living primely, I guess, I don't know when now in varnish. I'm going to check. I'm going to look this one up this afternoon. But uh, I don't know when nail, nail varnish was invented. But I guess it was only in the last couple of hundred years. And you know, cancer rates are growing and growing. And don't want to frighten anybody. It's all part of you know trying to live healthier and happier for longer and adding more life to your years. It's about doing as many steps as you possibly can. But maybe you have to occasionally wear like some of my TV presenters. Maybe you have to occasionally wear nail varnish. But yeah, on the days where you don't need to, don't wear the nail varnish. On the days where you don't need to. Definitely don't use aluminium anyway, but really cut down on you know the amount of uh, uh, deodorants that you, that you put on uh, and so on and so forth. So we're coming towards the end. Let me see if I can summarize Vicky Godfrey's advice on living healthy and happier for longer. <laughs> it's get a DNA test. So because there are some things in your DNA that can point you down the right path uh, of you know the sort of food that you should be eating. It's do a detox, um, and when you do your detox, think about not just what you're eating, but what you're putting on your skin. Um, and that can break down into several different areas, and don't underestimate the power of vitamin C and vitamin D. But I've just put words in your mouth. Um, you, give, give me your four, your, your four or five tips. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, give me your four or five <laughs> tips on living healthier and happier for longer. Um, be mindful of sugar and your alcohol intake just generally just just be mindful of it i'm not saying completely cut it out because that's quite difficult to do but but be mindful and mindful of your immune system do take vitamin c a day um vitamin c daily um two to three thousand if you want um for your collagen production uh, mopping up free radicals from the environment as it gets more and more toxic from the wi-fi and pollution and our water systems etc uh, and pesticides on our food so Vitamin C will help one pop out pesticides from our food. Um, four things. Do be aware of your vitamin D status. Uh, there is an um, online test that you can buy. I don't know if you guys sell 
online vitamin D tests, but you can buy them quite simply for about £25 or get them free from your GP. But do keep an eye on your status because your immune system will not work properly. Vitamin D is part of your innate immune system, which means that it just won't work properly if you don't have the right levels of vitamin D for, for you. And the fifth thing, I think really important, oh God, I could talk all day about <laughs> grounding and sleep, but um, do do sleep, do make sure you get enough sleep. Sleep is vital again to our health. And grounding is really good, bare feet on the floor, connecting to the earth's magnetic energy, um, again, reducing stress, anxiety, because also as well, stress is one of the biggest killers that there is and one of the most silent killers. So um, anything we can do to reduce stress in our lives and the damage it can do in the body, um, also great. So sorry, there was some kind of six there, or maybe I slipped a couple more in. But no, that was great. That. And until I liked about that, you mentioned the bare feet, which again, we haven't covered on any of the programmes yet. Uh, and I've written it about in all my books, I, I say, you know, whenever you can, for loads yeah. of different reasons. First of all, you know, I, I used to have problems with fungi on my big toenails. I've got an athlete's foot. But, you know, if, if you're sweating all the time, and sweating is not a bad thing, it's, we're supposed to sweat. But if you've got your socks on, they're in dark places. Think where mushrooms yeah. grow and fungi grows. It grows in damp, dark places. So the more you can expose your feet to you know the environment the better but also like you say it just connects you to the earth doesn't it i mean i mean maybe just expand on that a little bit for me so i think a good example is yoga when we do yoga we never wear socks or shoes and again that is so that the practice is quite a grounding practice um and in some of the poses you are encouraged by the teacher to almost imagine visualize that you're pushing your feet down into your mat which is connecting to the energy if we break ourselves down, we are all we are millions and trillions and trillions of atoms. And how Deepak Chopra explains it in his um, quantum healing book, which um, I, I studied cancer therapy for yoga, because I'm also a yoga teacher. And we were uh, one of, this is one of the books that we had to read as part of our course of um, yoga therapy for cancer. And it was about the quantum healing, and it was about if I can explain in terms of our atoms. In 365 days time, in one year's time, not one cell or one atom in your body will be the same. We are constantly like running water through a stream. No part of the running water of the stream is ever the same. It's constantly, constantly changing. And that's how our bodies are. And we are actually electrical beings. If we look at our heart, it's electrical currents, you know, hence we use a fibrillator when we um, have to bring somebody back because it's electrical currents. We are these. Um, and when we look at the Earth's currents, if you want to have a look, this is a real thing and not woo-woo, um, the Schumann resonance, that actually tells you the Earth's energetic um, resonance, really, of what's going on. And what's really interesting is when we do global meditation days, you can see spikes in, um, you can see spikes in the Earth's um, energy sectors when we do these global meditations. So it's it's we're energy, the earth is energy, and, and when we do grounding, it's about just really connecting our energy to the earth's energy and, and, and being at one with our planet and, um, you know, meditation again, really grounding in a meditation, standing strong, standing tall, pushing your feet down into the floor, huge, huge benefits. I don't know all the science on it. But um, I regularly do it myself. I encourage my children to always be barefoot, feet, barefoot, barefooted. No, you know, in bare feet, uh, running around the garden all the time, getting into dirt, getting into that 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 energy system. Really, hope that makes sense. Yeah, I say bare feet, flat feet, straight back. I mean, you know, considering yeah. we spend way much, way too much time sitting down as, as as a race, we're not designed to sit down all the time. Um, we don't sit down properly. You've got straight back as much as you can, flat feet on the floor. You know, there's loads of evidence that, 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 that ladies shouldn't be, not just ladies, but men as well, but mainly ladies with those big high heels, having your feet at that angle that, you know, is totally, totally unnatural. There's all problems with our hips eventually and backs eventually. So straight, flat feet on the floor, barefoot, straight back, all seems to make great, great sense. Hey, that, yes. that hour's flying, flown by. Absolutely loved having you on the show. Thanks, thanks for taking the time out. 
No, thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for the invite. No, you're welcome. And how does anybody find out more or get hold of one of your DNA kits and roughly what do they cost? Um, so we do have a special offer on at the moment. So the website is www.dnapal.me because it's about you. So dot me. Uh, that will take you to the website. There is a COVID special offer at the moment, which looks at just your immune system genes. That retails at £99. Um, but we also have, um, they, they generally retail at £199, £199. Um, you do get support from nutritional therapists after to help understand your report within that cost. Um, and you can find a bit about me there. As a naturopath at Harley Street um, Clinic, I offer uh, consultations on Skype um, or one-to-one -one in Harley Street. Um, and that you'll find more details at um, www.anaturalpath.co.uk. Oh, it's been absolutely fascinating, Vicky. Uh, thanks for taking the time out for us. And... Uh... Best of luck bringing those kids up a little bit more primarily than the way we've all been brought up. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for having me. It's been really lovely to meet you. Thank yeah. you. Likewise. Thank you very much indeed. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.